Hello, 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 hello. Everybody, take a seat, get a drink. Welcome to the Roundhouse Poetry Sam 2022. We are back. We are back in the Roundhouse main space for the 16th annual Roundhouse Poetry Slam. Yeah, we can make some noise for that. It's pretty bloody good. And tonight is the start of the Last Word Festival here at the Roundhouse. So thank you so much for joining us. It's great to have so many of you here. How are you all feeling? Feeling good? Feeling? <laughs> Average lackluster we're feeling. Okay, that's fine. That's absolutely fine. Post-pandemic, leaving the house is an achievement in itself, isn't it, really? Yeah, I barely made it here myself tonight. Up top, how are we feeling? Yes, okay, energy, love it, great. So, shout out to, have we got a camera? Shout out to, where's my camera, guys? Shout out to everybody who is live streaming at home. Thank you for joining us. We're, we're broadcasting around the UK uh, and around the world. So thank you for joining us. Um, shout out in the chat box where you're joining us from. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, so tonight is the culmination of the Roundhouse Poetry Slam heats. This year has been the biggest ever Roundhouse Poetry Slam in history. So there have been heats in Manchester, in Gloucester and in Glasgow and three heats here in London. And tonight you are going to be hearing from the highest scoring 10, 9, 10 poets from those heats. And they are all sat behind me looking absolutely petrified. Let's hear it for our Roundhouse Slam finalists. who are all impeccably dressed. They all look brilliant. No one has let the side down. You all look great. Well done. Good effort. Okay, lovely. Um, so, tonight, how tonight is going to work. Make some noise if you've been to a poetry slam before. And make some noise if this is your first ever slam experience. Oh, okay. Even split. Great. Okay. So, um, tonight, each of the poets behind me will perform two poems. One in the first half, and then in reverse order, one in the second half. They will come up to the stage. Um, they will bear their soul to you. They will share um, some of the most intimate, some of the most personal thoughts, feelings, ideas about what's going on in the world, things that have happened to them, lived experiences. And then our judging panel will assign it numerical value, okay? In the name of competition and capitalism. Woo! Uh, Hope you know what you've all signed up for. Great, okay. So each of the poets will have three minutes to deliver their work. If they go over that, they risk losing points. And if they go over four minutes, I will awkwardly shuffle onto the stage and push them off, okay? Metaphorically. Um, so, as I said, we have a judging panel um, who I'll introduce in a second. They will be scoring each of the poets uh, from zero to 10 based on their uh, performance and the writing of their poem with the understanding that it's absolutely ridiculous to score art and pit poets against each other. And actually tonight is really just about a showcase to, to show off all of the talent of the incredible writers sat behind me. Yeah, we can have a little cheer for that. Thank you. Table 36, I see you. That being said, there are prizes tonight. Back to capitalism. There are a few prizes tonight. Um, so second runner up will win 300 pounds. First runner-up will win £400. And first runner-up, I think this might be a record of the Roundhouse Sam. First runner-up, right, is going to win £1,000. Yes. Did you all know that? Did you know that? Oh, they didn't even know it. Okay, great. Um, I could use £1,000 as well. I might be, I'm probably going to join the slam at the end, okay? Joelle, you vote for me. Okay. Yeah. G gays have got to stick together. Okay, so... Um, what else do I have to tell you? So there may be some swearing tonight. Um, there may also be some content that you might find triggering in some way. So the Roundhouse don't censor any of the young people who take part in their slams. So you might hear references to subject matter such as sexism, racism, homophobia, transphobia, violence, sexual violence, self-harm, or things of that nature. And while we really encourage you to lean into conversations that might be difficult or challenging, we also want you to make sure that you're taking care of yourselves tonight. So if at any point you need to go outside, have a, have a glass of water, have a breath of fresh air, that's absolutely fine. Fe please feel free to do so. Outside of that situation, if you can avoid getting up and squeaking your chair to get your next glass of Merlot, 
when someone is on the stage sharing their heart, that would be greatly appreciated. Just wait for the interval or in between poems whilst everybody is clapping. Okay. We have two really brilliant BSL interpreters with us tonight who I've worked with before and they're a couple of my faves. Um, so please let's hear it for um, Jackie Beckford and Peter Abraham. And we also have a brilliant DJ with us keeping the vibes going. Please let's hear it for ODT. And we have uh, a panel of esteemed judges who I'm really excited to introduce to you. They're some of my faves as well. Um, so first up, we have someone who you may know by her online handle, Behind the Netra. She's a spoken word artist, a history teacher, and a writer from London. She's a regular on the BBC, Sunday Morning Live, Radio 4, and she worked with the UN on the He For She campaign. She's currently a research fellow at Burke Betts University's Centre for British Political Life. Uh, and Brown Girl Like Me is her debut book. Please, let's hear it for Jaspreet Kaur. <laughs> Our second judge is a lecturer of poetry at Manchester Metropolitan University and founder of the legendary Malaika's Poetry Kitchen. Um, she hosts and curates People Tree Press's literary podcast, New Caribbean Voices. She was the inaugural poet in residence at the Royal Shakespeare Company. Uh, she won the 2019 Charles Mondelez, don't know how to pronounce it, award, uh, and the uh, 2020 Forward Prize for Best Single Poem. She's won a lot of stuff, uh, and she's, she has lots of amazing accolades, but she's also um, one of the key figures for supporting emerging writers in the poetry scene in the UK. She's an absolute gem, and it's an honor to have her here tonight. Let's hear it for Malaika Booker. And last, but by no means least, uh, we have the author of four poetry collections, the latest of which, Conto and Othered Poems, won the T.S. Eliot Prize this year. If you don't know what that is, it's a big fucking deal, okay? It is probably like the biggest prize you can win in British poetry, okay? And she won it. She's a former UK National Poetry Slam champion, founder of Slambassadors, which was the youth national poetry um, slam tournament, which she ran for nearly 20 years. Um, she's the co-curator and the host for Outspoken Live at the South Bank Centre and the current editor of Outspoken Press. Uh, she has recently competed, completed a tour in Australia, Sydney Opera House, no big deal. Um, she's also working on converting her book into a stage play, a memoir, a novel, whatever's out there, she's bloody well doing it, okay? And like Malaika, she, uh, as well as creating poetry that's incredible in her own right, she's also a key figure in supporting emerging artists in London and beyond, and she's launched the careers of hundreds of young poets. So let's hear it for the incredible Joelle Taylor. You're going to be hearing performances from each of the judges throughout the evening. And at the end of the night, we have a special guest who you are going to be hearing performances from. He is a poet, a performer, a broadcaster, a podcaster. You might have heard of him. His name is George the Poet. Let's make some noise. And we also, I've introduced three judges to you, but there is also a fourth judge in the room. Can I get a an intrigued audience reaction noise. Ooh, okay, are you ready? The fourth judge is you, the audience! <laughs> Who bloody knew? So, at the end of the night, you will each have the chance to vote for one poet who was your favorite for the night, someone who moved you, who stirred you, who ruffled your feathers poetically. Whoever that person is tonight, you will have the chance to vote for them at the end of the show. Uh, I will tell you when the, when the lines will open. Um, and uh, the winner, the counts will be, the votes will be counted and verified, and the highest scoring poet will win the audience award, uh, and they will win 400 pounds in cold, hard cash. Yes, so it's a big responsibility. So make sure you're listening to all of the poets tonight. You can do your own scores throughout the night if you want to. You can make notes, do whatever you need to do, but just be ready. Uh, after the last poet has performed, you will have only five minutes to cast your vote. I'll tell you when the votes are open. Okay. So having said that, 
Um, it's, a, it's a huge achievement to even have made it to the finals of the Roundhouse Poetry Slam. Every single poet on this stage is already a winner tonight. Um, it's, all, it's also a, a daunting space to be performing in. It's pretty huge, in case you hadn't noticed. Some of these poets have been performing for years. Some of them, it's their first time ever performing in a space this big. Some of the poets have lots of friends and family here tonight, and some of them don't. So tonight, yes, you're voting at the end, but you are on team clap for everyone. So when someone gets onto the stage, when they finish a poem, we need you to use your hands, use your feet, use your mouths to show how much you support them, appreciate, love them, and just, you know, the poem could be shit. I mean, they're not. They're all great. <laughs> but even getting on this space and sharing something is a huge deal. So we need you to show your love and support for every single person who gets on the stage. So we're going to have a quick practice of that, and then I'm going to stop talking and we're going to get on with it. Um, people at home, we want you to... <laughs> I'm looking at this camera as if it's the eye of the world. Hello. It is, great. Hello, people at home. So um, we want you to join in with this so you can show us some love in the chat box. I want you, after three, I want you to pretend that one of these brilliant, impeccably dressed young people um, have just come onto the stage. They've just performed a poem. They performed their heart out. It moved you in some way. Maybe you laughed, maybe you cried. It made you think about something in a different way. They performed it. They left it on the stage. What does your reaction sound like? Yes, the feet, the feet in the stalls. Yes, that's exactly what it sounds like. Okay, love it, okay. I think we're about ready to get started. So, before we start the slam proper, we need a sacrificial poet on stage who is going to warm up our judges. They are going to warm up you, the audience, uh, and they are going to get our poetic ears pricked up. And who better to do that than our reigning roundhouse slam champion, the winner from last year, who is going to hand over her crown to the highest scoring poet tonight. Please give all of your love to our first performer of the evening, Maureen Onwanali. It's just great to be back. Hi, guys. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I will be performing two poems. Um, so yeah, the first one is called A Prayer to Black. <clears throat> blessed be the black. Black be blessed and beautiful and bold and bittersweet fruit. Black be fruitful and full of life and life be black too. Blessed be our mother's bones, the backbone to our black homes. Blessed be the home you make it back to. Blessed be the prayers. Blessed be the amens and anointing oil and night vigils and early mornings and pastors and peoples. And blessed be the black people. Black be fractured. Blessed be the broken. Blessed be the cracks we step over, the conversations that remain unspoken, the silence. Black be the elephant in every room. Blessed be the girl that speaks herself into existence. Blessed be the name that breathes life into her. And blessed be its proper pronunciation. <laughs> blessed be the poem that tells her she is alive. Blessed be the black girl. May she always feel alive. Black be needing a reminder that you are still alive. Blessed be the blood of Jesus. Blessed be the black boys that are still yet to resurrect. Blessed be the black boys that make it back. Blessed be the black of the boy. Blessed be boy. Blessed be black. Black boy, be black. Be boy. Smile and be black. Cry and be boy. Be black joy. Be black sadness. Blessed be the children. Blessed be the homes they belong to and the houses as well, because black be the home where the heart belongs to. Blessed be belonging. Blessed be the heart as well. And the congregation says amen. Thank you. Um, the next poem, I actually, I wrote this, like, I finished writing it this morning, I can't lie. So it's a working title, but so far I have, The Sun Will Never Set on number 10. Okay. <laughs> uh, 
The news says the cost of living is going up. The sky is stained tea bag orange, their hands stained working class red, and the sun sets over the street. The kids still swing over cracked concrete, and the street sign still reads no ball games in the same kind of eviction letter font that our parents watch out for in white envelopes, so big and bold, and all these kids can think of is how rusty this chain is, or how high up they can swing. And in this moment, this is as free as freedom gets, until all they can think of is how high up the rents can go, or how rusty this ball and chain is around brown ankles, and in this moment, this is as much freedom as this country can afford us. The news is still on at 6 p.m., and their suits are still steam-pressed an hour before. They say the cost of living is going up, but the women at the market stalls could have told you that, because now they don't tolerate no haggling no more, so the price is the price because they've got mouths to feed, and my mother's sighs grow deeper than the pockets she reaches into, because they say the cost of living is going up, but the bills could have told you that, because now we don't tolerate no haggling no more. They say the price is the price, so tell me, how much is this life worth if no one can afford to live it? The sky is now newspaper gray, and the only light at the end of the tunnel is a reflection coming from polished cufflinks on white collar crime sleeves glistening into the distance. And the government ministers say the price of living has gone up, but the kitchen walls could have told you that, because the kids don't steal food from pots no more, because the price went up, so portion sizes went down, and the cat's no longer curious when the food runs out, and the lines are still long, and out, hours have been cut, and what good is a poem when your home is not warm, and what use is a house haunted by white envelopes, and what good is a tax break when you're broken bones, when you've used broken bones to dig yourself out from a collapsing economy. They say the cost of living is going up, and I could have told you that. The sky is black, the hands are red, and the sun has set over my street. Thank you. Wow, okay, I think we're in for a good night. I think tonight's gonna be good. So, Roundhouse, are you ready for the slam to begin? Roundhouse, are you ready for the slam to begin? Let's hear it for our first slammer of the evening, Leva! Hello, um, I'm first tonight, so that's a bit nerve-wracking. But um, yeah, this is my first poem of the night. Um, I don't have a title for this, um, I'm bad at titles, so... <laughs> I guess for now, at least, this is untitled. Maybe death is a learned thing, the whites of my eyes, the blood in my gums. Forgiveness invites me to sit down. I am carrying a silver platter with my own head on it. I offer everyone a piece, a dinner party in spring, cherry blossom lining the roof. There will always be a pulse of grief running through who I am, but I forgive the world because it has you in it. I forgive myself, slowly, slightly, begrudgingly, but I forgive the world because it has you in it. Maybe love is a learned thing. Forgiveness asks me a question in the garden and says, kiss me with your silver tongue, your crooked teeth and hymns unsung light pouring from me. The spring sunlight paints me golden. I want wings. I want to be ripped apart. I want to be holy. And now I'm whispering under my breath, I think, if I could do this all again, I'd never pick you. I think if I could do this all again, I'd never pick anyone else. Do you understand? All this is just to say that I take different trains and they all stop at the same station. Maybe faith is a learned thing. I stand underneath the apple tree and watch my mum watch hers. 
All my poems sound like eulogies now. How do you kill an already dead body? I want my poems to sound like prayers now. And forgiveness forgives me, says, hello, sit down, have you eaten yet? Cradles my face gently, the bloody outline of her hand on my cheek reminds me that nothing comes easy, especially grief especially dinner parties, but I forgive the world because it has you in it. I forgive myself slowly, gradually, steadily. Let's hear it for Lieber. And keep that look going for your next slammer of the evening, Michael Sukan. Hello. Um, yeah, I don't have a name for this poem either. <laughs> and it, it might sound a little similar to uh, something you've just heard. Not that one. Uh, yeah. My most expensive hobby is having a place to live. No ball games. No dogs allowed or skateboarding permitted. No feet on the grass of the upper petticoat gentleman ruling class. Private green property won by a genetic hidden lottery. Dirty toy soldiers on free school meals riding sparkly bikes with no wheels. With a little bit of luck we can make it through the undeserving austerity wearing a bow tie. And governments are doing their best to fight dirty poverty by punching the worthy poor in the face my kidney's battery is low, cut open with a thirsty scalpel and sold. I can't afford to get the train, so I'll shiver on benefits whilst the mortal crisp packets run out of petrol on the sub-aquatic highway and polish the rainbow microtoxic mucky stones in our lungs. It's a nice day for a white party and secret discos for little piggies wrapped in money blankets and get out of jail free cards as we flip budget burgers with covid masks through their window hold your breath for 30 minutes three hours four years and me and my wallet we're gonna start a blog called how to make income online to help pay for our central heating Cause you're hot, then you're cold, you're yes, then you're no I might freeze to death if I don't get paid At the work event, I'll tell you about dinner My last meal was from a food bank The same stickly, sicky tomato soup we bathed in Herds of candles flickering in remembrance of cheaper electric bills The degree I made on Photoshop is in a velvet body bag At Ikea, great value <laughs> And the royal family are releasing a mixtape with Drake this year, slobbering like a walrus to help attract tourists and improve voter relations. The meek shall inherit the dirt. Grim ballerinas coding for the MI5. Delivery drivers dancing for the Amazon ballet. Unhinged poets live on compressed mountains of oily testicle cheese. England's dirt is building up, building up building up. England's dirt is building up. Orange, fuzzy, cannibal rats smile as the plague returns. Let's hear it from Michael. Keep that love going for your next poet to the stage. Please welcome up Yasmin Dankwa. <laughs> Hello, um, this poem is called I Love Hip Hop, But I Think He Hates Me. <laughs> I love hip hop, but I think he hates me. For context, we were cool, 
used to kick it way back when, chilling on the block, yeah, with all our friends, and used to pretend that we'd make it out of ends, pinky promises of riches, of promised lands, and freedom. Spray paint it across the wall, said he and I, yeah, he and I would have it all, and he would be boy, and I would be girl, never lessen our expression, we're on top of the world. Starting with a party, hip-hop gets on the mic. The hay to the hoe with an easy E flow, rapping over samples all through the night. And it's then I hear his words. Oh, his words. And the words that he used were imbued with wisdom, made everyone in every city stop to listen. Fast forward a couple of months and hip hop, you change. Let the media make you, shape you into something that ain't true, ain't you. But gangster was the label, you accepted this. I think he promises unhooked, you shook the white man's hand. I was the one you overlooked. No, you don't understand how the money's made you blind. And I was pushed to the side as you strived for a better life without me. As you strived for a better life without we. Miss that you and I, T, Y. But I guess it's time to say goodbye to this. Because you got a little braggadocious. Rhymes a little less complex, you weren't in it for the love, saw the status I expect, the respect that you get is a lot more than before now. Funny how I'm the one you use just to sell out of nowhere, I heard you saying on air how I was gutter aggressive and angry, don't get it. Rougher than rubber and you think I'm a menace. Hoochies and hoes, you're doing the most to tarnish the skin that I'm living in. You weren't even kidding when you shaded the shade of the melanin that brought you into the world, I mean, who are you playing, boy? I'm just saying, boy, I'm more than your plaything, more than the arse and the tits that you claim is yours. Well, it ain't. That's not the picture I continue to let you paint of me, because actually, every tear shed of you built a better me. Yeah, your love is a cold, distant memory. And when you left, I started to reflect. Pen to paper made me blind to the time, writing rhymes. It's then that I realize. It's when I realize. That hip hop is more than just a he. Because when I look back, look back, look back to my history and my ancestors who wrapped rings and rhapsodies around these so called kings who silenced men in ciphers, words like rifles shot them down, I knew hip hop could be a woman who'd forever wear the crown. Thank you. Let's hear it for Yasmin. Keep that love going for our next poet to the stage, Bonnie Coughlin. This poem is called Dear Helen. Dear Helen, I love to think of you at five years old playing zipline alone in the school ground. Arms up, stretched in the air, screaming as you flew, too lost in your own world to notice taunts who might have bullied you had you been anywhere in the right postcode. Dear Helen, silence might become you with the curiosity of a stern complexion, consuming life to scrape nutrition from tinderboxes, but I miss your voice. Before we learnt to shape sentiments, losing sentience or begging Mr. Speaker to be heard, I'd rather cut my tongue on a chip than take it off my shoulder. It's comfier than the parrot whose voice sounds nothing like yours. Dear Helen, you are the lenses in my rose-tinted glasses. I put them on after the race. As fuzzy black clouds pixelated, I spat cheerfully cherry vomit into the lake, drifting away to coat the boat in shades of acid berry. Dear Helen... I think it might be time to retreat. I think the worlds we shaped in preschool are preferable. I can't find a soapbox to grant my voice entrance to even anecdotes. My mouth is throffing with bubbling interjections and I'd rather share your silence. I'd rather write to you than write my life to a textbook. When did being understood become an act of education? Dear Helen, let's Take a beat, a second, to swing from syntax to syllogism, curling up in the kitchen sink, to lullabies of when I didn't need a phone, a pen, or a pad to be heard, to when you hadn't cut your hair yet. 
I'd plied apart dandruff into clumps of knotted braids. When the distance from your head to your from your, the, your scalp to the tips of your hair was longer than the patience of your brush. When you'd had sticky hummus hands mopped up from school pack lunches. When you used to manspread in pajama shorts, probably flashing your fanny, topped off with gra grandma's green jumper. Dear Helen, could you send me a soundbite of nonsense? I've been holding on to C minor for too long to stay in pitch. I could really use a limerick to get me through. I could use your voice for cartographic self-soothing. When maps became fishing, we'd pointed a pike at the third star from the right who'd said in your new silence that we were never straight enough to go on till morning. We'd tied up thoughts in our shoelaces, no time to thread a ribbon through the chasm when the camel paddled backwards through the eye of the needle just to cut us off. I need your arms up screaming to live in your play pretend of zip lines, to live in your postcode, filling notebooks in the meantime with jotted notes of dear Helen, of hoping to be heard. Thank you. Let's hear it for Bonnie. Keep your applause going for our next poet to the stage, Leo Drayton. Yikes, there is a lot of people. Okay, um, hi. Um, this poem is called My Little Brother and it's about an amalgamation of my brothers. A loud, creaky door, cashier till drawer, and the passing laughs of strangers. My brother laps the corner shop, then laps it once again, scanning aisles and wiping floor tiles with the sticky side of his trainers. He's five, red hair and no front teeth, got mud between his fingernails and scrapes on both his knees. We're on our way home from the park, where monkey boys braved the monkey bars, and younger boys played with contraband toy cars, and between the bickering and banter on the far side of the park stood my little brother. Land Rover in one hand and a clenched call for adventure in the other. See, he's a hero. Fought monsters, battled pirates, rescued Rapunzel and saved his mayfly friends. Astute creative acumen and proficient at play pretend. My little brother did it all. Swung from the skies with the world in his pocket. Built aircrafts and spaceships with Lego building blocks. Swapped a wristwatch for Dali clocks and cocks a guy forks plot using Barbie dolls and action men. Blow up the bad guys who steal from the poor. To me, he's a genius, but they say he's the naughty kid in class, pigeonholed at five years old, and we all know these labels last. Bored out of his mind, he will pass the time however he knows how. You give him pages of equations, but never test his ability to create. Score a fish on his tree climbing skills, but never on dodging bait. So instead of answering your superficial questions, he would rather sit and break apart his pen just to put it back together again. The prophecy is set in the mold of the itchy classroom carpet where cross-legged kids sit with crayon labels darted on the bullseye of their brain. Forever woven into the fabric, a mere mention of their name, it frames the way people see you. And I think they're afraid of you, little bro. Because whilst the other kids quote their times tables, you're making new ones. Infinity times possibility equals a daydream blend of reality. Forget fractions and who needs a decimal point? Precise measurements are pointless anyway. You don't need to know how to spell when you're making your own language, and theory isn't useful unless you use it. They're afraid of your power, because at five years old, you run rings around your teachers, ask questions they can't answer, fix problems they didn't know they had. I watched you equalize the wobble of a table using nothing but a napkin and a nibbled fingernail. They're afraid of your kindness. How can a kid be so selfless? They've never seen a five-year-old share his sweets with a man wrapped in rags at the end of the streets. But you do that any day, because everyone's a friend to you. So don't listen to them, little bro. They want to hold you back, because boring boys become boring men, and then they will learn that boring breeds boring, and the cycle never stops. They keep that cycle going, so they will always land on top. And if it were to stop, when it does, when you... Leave the restraints of thinking inside the box. There's no telling what you could do. You could set fire to the world and rebuild it from the bottom because at five years old, you already know this world doesn't work, but they don't want you to fix it. 
Thank you. Let's hear it for Leo. We are halfway through the first half. So different. Everyone is so different, so amazing. I don't envy the judges tonight. How are we all feeling, everyone? All right, still with me? Okay, great. People up top, how are we doing? Great, okay. Judges, how are we? All good? Great, fab. Okay, right, we're going to carry on. We're going to get bloody hell straight back into it. Please welcome your next poet to the stage, Spencer Mason. Good night. How are we doing? Uh, this is a poem called And Let Me Choose. Another victim of my rhythm is taking centre stage of her fragrant iris. Facade stolen, dilapidated rhymes, gallus as love compared to the crimes of my nature. So it's like looking at you is a reminder that I am me and hearing that voice, your phantom dressed in satin is a reminder that I could be we, we could be you, you and she could be me, he and she could be in me, is me, but at the end of the day, nothing would change either of us from being I. We, not reduced to an us, but emboldened as a they. But what if I'm already a they, or a them, processing this precarious addiction to dereliction through a leaking fountain pen? I've been replacing a needle with an ink cartridge, an agenda that evolves into sex. But when I picture me or I in the context of our us, then it's me with the shaved legs dangling from a floral dress. So then, later, shirtless in bed, I start to stress that maybe my sex does neglect, so I hope you never resent or regret or feel the need to repent for recompense. I beg you, please just reassure me that you consent to wasting your time with me. With two fingers and no ears hovering over the self-destruct button in the dip of my titanium elbow, I try to take his advice. Work well on what you like when you can. Play fiercer than your need to be productive. Eat well with your body, love with your tongue, I try. But when I want myself as you do, jarring as I touch that part, boy, of my body, it is like chewing an iron scourer to clean my teeth. It is my skeletal anvil and the hammer of my father, yet no matter how I try to sever these tendencies, I will always leave discrepancies. Like, like I'm a bad actor with an inaccurate accent, accused of acting with appalling apathy, like it was actually an accident, when the fact of the matter is that perhaps I'm just not that good at life. I got several suitcases, nowhere to go. The dishes won't drip, tea towel never dries, fear of what I'll find if I reach inside the pillowcase at night. So now waiting across from her lavender mouth, with my stomach playing shite mares and my tongue tied in a noose, I think, well, yeah, you can use me. Every crevice, make new ravines, fisher me whole, please, make my body yours, but she don't, she makes it mine instead, so yes, pull my hair, rip me out of these chains and into yours, kiss me with your calm, but fuck me with your violence as long as you give me voice in the silence and let me choose. Thank you. Let's hear it for Spencer. And keep your love going for our next poet to the stage, Ife. My body was made of choruses, bound together in symphony, blood flowing through my veins in unapologetic rejoicement. I learned to dance before I could walk. And for people like me, 
Like my ancestors, dance has always been our saving grace. So from young, we like to stomp, stomp, clap the beak to victory, merely our way out of oppression, and we jumped high. So we never felt low. When I dance, I feel free. Like a bird who can fly away from danger, or like a lion who can face it head on. When I dance, I say to the world that caged birds, they don't just sing, they got funky feet too. When I dance, I feel powerful and vulnerable at the same time. When I dance, it's like I'm connected to God. And while you all can't hear the music, my soul hears it clearly because it sounds like prayer. Like Sunday service. Like my great-great-grandmother coming back from the grave to give me a high five, which is to say that I don't dance alone. Ghosts dance with me. And sometimes I just dance to forget as if moving these hips will help me erase the image of the ones who can't move theirs. Like if I dance long enough, maybe I'll forget to cry because these hips, they don't just lie, they hold secrets. They tell of a truth passed down generation. They tell tales of love, of joy, of truth, of genocide, of forbidden queer lineage. And isn't that beautiful? Isn't that a story worth sharing? So maybe that's why when my ancestors were hung on trees, they still swayed in the wind. Because we learned to dance longer than we live, to move longer than we breathe. Despite blood and tears, we dance. Who do you think invented dancing in the rain? And for some people, dance is just music. It's fun, but for us, dance is our battle cry. It's finding home in a beat, comfort in a pop, security in a nay-nay, it's resilience. It's feeling carefree in a war zone. It's knowing that during the worst of times where the world tried to strip this joy from my body, I am never unarmed because dance is my weapon. It's my uncompromising glory. So come on, world. Why don't you step onto my dance floor? Give me what you got. Give me your S Club 7 TikTok dance moves and try to keep up. Let's hope for Ife. And welcome your next poet to the stage, Ezra England. Hello. Uh, so I wrote this poem in response to a builder who wolf-whistled at me during lockdown one. So it's called, To the Builder Who Wolf-Whistled at Me During Lockdown One. <laughs> Mr. Bob the Builder, you stand there with your drill, your big filthy lump of cement. Let's not pretend we both don't know what your sweet whistle meant. You wolf man, I want your digger inside my parts. Hammer me, you sweaty fat bold work of art. Oh. My legs are a ladder for you. Scale me and climb me and varnish me too. Oh, Mr. Bob the Builder, what I would pay to drill you. I know your currency is biscuits and cups of tea, so treat me like a sweet treat you dunk in your dreams. I am a whore of a hobnob. <laughs> Mr. Bob the Builder, let's come to an arrangement. You're a biscuit businessman, you muddy cookie, you like to looky-looky. Let's fuck in your truck three times for good luck. Grab your hard helmet, put it on your head, tie me up with hazard tape, the driver's seat's our bed. Oh, Mr. Bob the Builder. You naughty high-vis jacket wearing potato of jizz. When we're done, go on, throw me in this skip. I like it rough, can't get enough of your rubbish tip. Oh, Mr. Bob the Builder, please be gentle, won't you? I'm delicate after all, plaster me to the wall, smother me in sweat and sand, oh, I go crazy at the touch of your hand. Oh, Mr. Bob the Builder, I want you, like a glue gun wants glue. Like a hole needs filling, a nail needs drilling, I ache for the taste of your toolkit slipping, let's head to a place we can just keep digging, your gloves on my face, oh my God, I'm living, and all I can taste is cement on your scent, and now I know what your sweet whistle meant, you animal man, you build a bear, I'm yours to have, so take me there. Thank you. Let's hear it for Ezra. Keep that love going for our next poet to the stage, Jacqueline Congera. This poem is for the men in our families chosen or blood, who have suffered and caused suffering, 
who have made a home of masculinity's porch, who would die to be let in, who are most alive when they remain outside. The men in my family are addicted to bottles and bequest. Buffalo soldier brings them to their feet. They grunt, sing, burp liberation while their sons wait in the car. The men in my family do not look alike until eyes turn ruby and lips reveal matching pink gray gum saliva thick as their pride. They turn brides into bloodbaths, burn goat meat as they argue, bruise knuckles and claw flesh to the drumbeat of that Brenda Fussy song. The men in my family weep while their wives do the cooking hold themselves when no one is looking, rib to thigh, knees to chest, obsessed with things that grow small, like a dream with no detail or a promise soaked in alcohol. I think of the men in my family when I see a black boy run, when I see a black boy catch a butterfly, when I hope the black boy sets it free. I think of the men in my family when I see a black boy rest, bent in plain sight, to rib to thigh, knee to chest, a thing that grows small, hot, and held at last. Thank you. Let's hear it for Jacqueline. And welcome your final poet of the first half to the stage. Let's hear it for Rhea Bronte. Hi everyone. Can this come off? Don't want to be too violent with it. Um, can I talk for a wee 30 seconds? Is that okay? 45. Um, just a wee quick question for everyone. I want to know how many people have felt like there's something really wrong with them. Because, I mean, me and a lot of my friends do. <laughs> I just want to know how common it is. Something, thought there's something really wrong with you and that you just need to fix it. You just need to control stuff in your life. Otherwise, you're fucked. Okay, quite a lot of people. <laughs> Big cuddles to you. <laughs> um, okay, so this is a... Well, okay, Nick Cave, a singer I really like, said that to remain steadfast on the borders of another's grief is the greatest, most holy act of love one can perform. And uh, this poem is called Ode to Compassionate People. It's for everyone in my life, um, and artists and poets as well, to be honest, who share and hold space for that feeling. Um, and help me to see that there's nothing wrong with me because I suffer. So. I don't feel self-pity when I'm with you. Hyper-identified with, tainted by, and tied to tragedy. Instead, I feel believed in and understood. And I reject that ingrained superstitious belief that chaos and self-destruction is an incurable disease stuck to my family and stuck inside of me. See, sometimes I resent that I have to constantly detwist from one million deluding strings in my head, that I have to constantly unlearn hideous, hideous childhood conditioning. And then my eyes obsess over my limits with every tiny problem taught to flick that switch of shame and helplessness. But see you, after years of watching me writhe and contort and mangle and warp in pain, you say to me every single day that you trust in my joyful nature. All the same. And your trust in me, and your trust in my strength, leads me down some unknown, hopeful way. See, when I'm with you, when I'm reading poetry, and when I'm with my friends, I can just exist. I let myself move, and I let myself live. 
And I remember that healing is actually far simpler than I think and far more self-compassionate than all of this. See, I've been using self-help as self-fear and hatred. See, this helps me to remember all those times it's actually worked. Untying every internal judgmental knot with gentle, careful words. See, I don't feel terrified of influence and every energetic friction when I'm with you. I don't feel terrified of all these uh, corruptive forces waiting to pervade my very core. I don't feel like I need fixed anymore. See, I don't feel like a victim when I'm with you. Or even at fault, because I didn't cause all that terror that has ensued. See, I don't feel like a criminal who's committed one million mysterious treasons. I just feel like a human being. Thank you. Let's hear it for Ria and all of the poets that you've heard in the first half. What a start to the slam. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for all the poets who performed. We are now going to hear from one of our judges. Um, I introduced her earlier. She is a living legend, icon, amazing, incredible. She's walking the stairs. It's going to take a second. Let's break it down. Oh, oh, look at our wall. Welcome to the stage, Malika Booker. Oh my God, there's a lot of people out here. Hi, good evening, everyone. Are you floating and, and high on the poetry? Yeah? Okay. Um, I heard murmurs. Heard Ophelia, Ophelia, get up. Smelt, smelling salts, lime call. I heard priest's prayers. My body was quarry stone. My world had turned gray. The motherland had called our sons to our bosom. Come, sons, come. Fight for your motherland, she said. Then that bitch pressed her callous feet onto our boys' backs until spines cracked, then grind those broken bones into pieces and did not send their crumbs back. What mother does not want the crumpled dust of her son instead of nothing? Him dead. I rend my red rotten cotton dress, beat my breast bloody, sewed coarse rice sack dresses, then grate my skin raw, rubbed ashes from rage into my sobbing skin. Unlike Jacob, my son is dead. Oh son, who bared your corpse down there a foreign? Who fling white rump on the ground? Son, I have no language for this loss. Him dead, I turn over your mattress, line up your slippers and one dress shoe, rearrange your furniture, and find I care nothing for terms like deserter or coward. You are my son. What title can be little, my son? Oh, son. Who pell down dominoes down there a foreign? Who keep vigil over your body all night? Son, I have no language for this loss. Him dead, I yank out my cane rows, tear my hair up savage tugs and pulls until it turn matted bush, a hive for bees, fat, succulent ones, ruled by a king called George. The day I whispered your death news to the bees, I broke the king's back. Oh, son. Who stop their clocks down there foreign? Who sing Sankey and read scripture? Son, I have no language for this loss. Him dead, I covered the mirrors, sipped cocoa tea, watched the breadfruit tree where her navel string was buried and feel to take an ax and chop and chop and chop when I think about how they take you whole and send you back an inked name on paper. They say when she heard, she fell into a trance. And then she holla and she holla. And the next day she went into the front of the house with a shovel and dig and turn the earth till her hands looked like raw meat and blood dripped from that handle. And when she had made a row of beds, how she bent her back and crawled in the dirt, 
pushing in the seeds in that punishing sun, howling her son Herbert's name like psalm, like hymn, like scripture. It would be said that in the absence of a body, she had to bury something. How she'd rather he'd returned home crippled or crazy like some of the soldiers deposited back like sour fruit, limbs missing, or muttering to themselves, or flinging their bodies down on the ground at any loud noise, blocking the city like vagrants, like the refuge that England refused. How she'd seen there was no glory to be had, so prepared herself. Was it not she who told him, sign up for king and country, for motherland, for glory, proud of her soldier's son, knowing his insides were soft like egg, but determined for him to return, but not like this. News on a paper, scratching on a telegram, visit to her door, how guilt mixed up with sorrow, and now she's making him a garden of flowers, a monument, a way of burying something into this island's earth. See, in this small place, your worth as a woman is measured by the number of sons you produce. Each day is long, and I cook up pots of empty. The main ingredient is loss with a dash of woes. It's scent foul, stagnant, and cloudy. My only boy child is dead, young, still in his chin. That bitch of a stepmother, England, built a forest of bones for rats to feast on succulent black men. The scent of our actions rancid as hell, and now I am worthless. My grief is a carcass swinging on a butcher's hook, stabbed into the back of my neck. And my neighbor's sympathy simply slices each pound of flesh. Thank you very much. That is the end of the first half. Remember, start of the second half, I'll let you know when you each get to cast a vote for your favorite poet of the day. Um, we're gonna take a 20 minute, we're gonna start in a, a 15 minute break and we're gonna start on the dot in 20 minutes time. Go and get a drink, go and speak to a poet and we'll see you in 15 minutes time.
The Roundhouse is an inspiring space to walk into, but what makes it even more exciting is our dedicated space for young people right here in the Roundhouse studios. When I'm in the studios, I run into fashion designers, videographers, all sorts of creatives. And uh, we usually do get inspired by each other, which is leads to a great conducive environment for creativity overall. What makes us really unique is the way that we work with young people. By embedding young people in our governance model, it ensures that young people we work with are at the heart of the decision-making processes across the organisation. I think being a young person at the Roundhouse really feels like I'm not being put in a box. Like I can just be free to be who I am and meet other young people who are doing the same thing. So I joined the Roundhouse Choir when I was 16. I was doing my GCSEs at the time and it really provided an escape for me, uh, a place to find who I was, find my voice, my confidence. We focus on potential, but what young people will be less aware of is the holistic support provided by our youth work team. Well, I learned about the Roundhouse to a friend who referred me to a program. I joined that program and at the end, one of the youth workers referred me to another program the Roundhouse was having. Two years later, I'm now creating music at a much higher level than when I first came in and I'm also marketing assistant at the Roundhouse. So many of the young people that we work with have creative potential and key to the work that we do is to prepare them for a job in the creative industries. Thanks to the Business Accelerator programme, my business went from just being a really good idea to being a company that empowers and supports my community. We treat the young people we work with as young professionals by providing them with access to industry standard equipment and networks. And I have access to tech that I don't normally do. It feels like I don't have to wait to for five years of practice to be able to afford these things, this space or this equipment. I can just do it now. I'm already the person I'm aspiring to be at the Roundhouse. We already work with 7,500 young people per year and within the next five years we aim to double our reach. We've already started building our new creative centre which will enable us to introduce new access to industry and into work programmes. What young people have told us is that there's a gap as they enter the world of work and our new programmes will provide the practical skills, experience and networks to make that transition successfully. So I got loads of really great skills out of the programme, uh, business skills like marketing and making a financial plan, um, but the main thing that I got out of it was confidence and self-belief and those are priceless. I think young people are going to be able to develop skills in areas that they would not have the opportunity to develop otherwise um, and that means that in the future we'll really be able to thrive in the industry um, and voices will get heard that we don't normally get to hear. With your support, Within the next five years, we will have doubled our reach, extended our programme and will be a leading example of upskilling the next generation. Rise up for the Roundhouse. Rise up for the Roundhouse. Rise up for the Roundhouse. Rise up for the Roundhouse.
Hello, 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 and welcome back to the Roundhouse Poetry Slam 2022. Yes. Before we get started, can we just make some noise for the incredible staff and volunteers at the Roundhouse who have made tonight possible? Just getting a bit of water. So, at the start of the second half, we need a sacrificial poet uh, who is going to warm you up again. So, I'm going to transition between microphones. Okay. Um, so, I'm going to share a very short poem with you um, before I introduce Joelle onto the stage. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Um, I thought I would enter into the terrifying nature of slam by reading something that I've never performed before. Um, it's brand new. It's not really finished, but I thought, you know, in for a penny, in for a pound. So... Um, it's, it's a found poem, which is made entirely from uh, phrases and words that I stole from profiles on a, day, on a gay dating app. <laughs> dating in the loosest sense of the word. <laughs> I think it's appropriate. It's, pa it's past watershed, is it? It's past nine o'clock, it's fine, yeah? Okay. We're all up for a bit of dirt, aren't we? Great, okay. It's called, My Photo May Imply... I'm cuddly with a good sense of humor. That's just good lighting. <laughs> Looking for someone whose thighs could crush my skull. A mustache the size of Nottingham. Please don't open with a pic of your moral of the story. Show me a dick with purpose. A photogenic dick, a dick with a future. Not good at describing myself as anything more than legs and smoke. I'm a good time. All spaghetti, no regretti. <laughs> Current affairs dick. Dick with something between the ears. Sure, one day I'd like to kiss someone without the hairy insect feeling after, but I don't think I have it in me. I've grown up on empty bus seats and canned fruit. Breakfast has been prep and spit for so long, I can't make toast anymore. My past is headless and unsolicited. It's a long story, but no different to yours, probably. There's a dick under my bed. I try to be kind. I'm 5'10". I'm still blindfolded on my knees in a darkened room, waiting for someone to say, you're all right, kid. Thank you. We are going to get straight back into it with one of our phenomenal judges. She's an icon, she's a legend, and she is the moment. Please welcome to the stage, Joelle Taylor. Big up your mincers, you all right? So um, this is a bit of a holy space, isn't it? All these, yeah, thank you. All these... Um, Theatres are spaces where our young folk come in and they explore themselves and they explore their art and then they share it with you. These become these kind of holy spaces. So I wanted to go back in time a little bit and do an older poem. And this poem is dedicated to anyone who doesn't know, I founded Slambassadors, which is the National Youth Slams. And um, really the project was about finding kids who are like me growing up, kids from the ends, no access to the arts, and providing platforms for them. And we created a really strong, powerful team, and we were kind of family for a while. I could go on. Um, but this poem is for somebody who didn't make it, who was a core member of our team. And I'm going to do this poem because this is the kind of space where I believe the pace will be listening. This is for Thomas Kareem Crosby. But it's also for all of you who feel like you can't go on anymore. I just want you to remember that everything you've ever lost is still here. Everything you have ever lost is in here. How the lines on your face were written. How you could not afford your own face. How your face was a battlefield, a war between parents. How your pockets were tunnels and you were lost in them. How no one came, even though you called all night. How your call was the sound of something small, 
breaking how your teeth were tower blocks in which only white ghosts lived, how your skin was a lost birth certificate, how your birth certificate was proof of your death, how they stole your smile to store on a high supermarket shelf, how the industry unmade you, how your tongue was a conveyor belt and you could not make the words fast enough. How your soul was kept well fed in a zoo. How the zoo was a library of lost souls. How the soul stared unblinking from behind glass enclosures. How the glass was etched with the hieroglyphics of rage. How you made an origami figure of a small boy staring. How some boys cry with their fists. How some boys hang themselves from the thin edges of their smiles. How they told you that white was the color that contained all others. How your skin became a color that contained you. How skin becomes insignia. How they sold black back to you at inflated prices, how rainbows are portents, how rainbows are borders, how you traveled to the other side of the rainbow and met a stranger traveling back the way you had come, how the stranger looks like you, how you are a stranger, how your ancestors will be born after you, everything you've ever lost is in here. How they spat at you, and the saliva became a sea, and you sailed easily across it to the other side of your heart. How your heart was a tectonic plate, how your heart rubbed, how it drifted apart, how other people set up home on the opposite side of your heart to you, how they sent smoke signals, how you answered, how your words turned to ash and blew away, how your voice was thin ice. You were afraid to walk across how silence was a song your enemy taught you. How the last bus home took you to another man's city. How home keeps moving. How our streets were gentrified. How they gentrified our stages. How we were forced out of our own mouths. How you were raped son, by a high court judge. How judges' wigs are mushroom clouds floating over the horizon. How your dreams were trained to walk in tight circles. How your dreams were dogs. How your father was a bomb and your mother rich in minerals. How you were dead. How you were. And death brought you flowers and you said, but we said, and then she said, how death waited outside all night, how pebbles against windows sound like Aleppo, how your mouth was a tornado that drew the whole town to it. Everything you have ever lost is here. When you could have let love sit beside you on a broken back sofa and change the channel, son. When maybe only one hand was required, when perhaps if you'd placed your palm prints beside each other, you might have found that they made an atlas that could have led you out of here, and love could have woken you, and you could have fallen, and through falling, uncovered the archaeology of your wings, when after the grey apocalypse that no one else noticed, you might have realized trees hold hands beneath the earth. How you learn to hold hands beneath the earth. Everything you have ever lost is here. Here is the music of your brother breathing. Here is the shape of your mother. Here is your unfound song. Here is the legend of your lost tongue. Here are your teeth, your brittle, your bone. Everything you have ever lost, it's here. And I've come to bring you home. Thank you very much.
Let's hear it for Joelle Taylor. Okay, wow. Please do go and find the work of the judges, support them, find their books. They're doing incredible things. If you've liked what you heard, you're going to like a whole lot more of what you find when you look for it. When I, when I say roundhouse, you say slam. Roundhouse. Yeah. Roundhouse. Yeah. When I say I am having a gay old time tonight, you say, of course you bloody well are, Toby. You're at the roundhouse slam. <laughs> I'm having a gay old time tonight. Wait, okay, I'm glad we're on the same page. Okay, we're going to get straight back into it in reverse order from the first half. Please welcome to the stage our first poet, Ria Baronti. First of all, that was amazing. I was like, oh, I'm going to sob and I can't perform now. Um, wow. Uh, this is called Erotic Little Death. And it's um, a poem I wrote for the first woman I ever loved. It was for her birthday. And um, I read it back a while later and I was like, this is good. <laughs> this is quite good. And um, when I've performed it, it's helped me overcome shame a lot. So, yeah. Erotic Little Death. With each unifying kiss Beneath me, the earth lifts me far above the floors of agonizing falls. And your soft, such soft lip bites, they make my pussy throb. I'm so soothed by your touch. When you flick your tongue to my heart's pulse, to the billowing beat of the drum, your fingers ignite great flutters in my chest and quivers in my legs. How can this be as mighty as a deluge cleansing, yet it's all so tender? I shudder, you're melting. See, ever since meeting you, I walk around with astonishing lightness, as if life's punishment had finally fucking ended. And see that unbearable cry that shakes the very air when I feel fear. I'm so used to that feeling, it's always near. But when I'm with you, even the memory of that cry has disappeared. Your breath's all over me now. I hear my rattling chains. Our lips sway and collapse into oneness. And like the ebb and flow of great waves, we rise above and fall deep deep into this sea's rich underworld. I feel you take my throat. A little bit tighter becomes your gentle, loving chokehold. And I'm led to a trembling paradise by your strokes and your lust and your moans and your touch and your awestruck eyes soaked in love. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you to her. <laughs> and Ria. That was Ria Bronte. Remember to make a note of your favourite poets. You will be voting for them at the end of this round. Ria Bronte. Okay, next up, please keep that applause going. Our second poet of the second half, Jacqueline Nkonjera. Hello again. This poem is called, We Bury Our Dead at Dawn. Our tongues tremor before sunrise, throats widen, make room for the sirens. Casket open for the village to see the nose that belongs to this family. 
Last born eyes scrutinize familiar features beneath unusual colors. A pastel palette. What do you call a black man turned chameleon? Turned gray, blue, or yellow? Turned still beneath moon glow, delicate and desperate to be lowered before the sun shows? What do you call a wife turned widow? Had no plans to carry a dead man's last name, to birth children of a dead man's tribe. Shakes her head each time she says his name, like fruit overripe, too sweet to taste right. What do you call a mother turned mortician? The journey from swaddle to suit is as heavenly as it is hellish. Ask the priest turned prisoner of prayers that promise to protect. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Hail Mary, full of grace. How could you take him from me? And now what do I call myself? A daughter turned distant, who did not know that death is a slow process no matter how quickly they go. Who did not know that memories are living, breathing creatures that evolve as they grow. They become stubborn with age, unwilling to change or remain the same. They are unpredictable, unreliable. If not tended to, they will leave. And I wish you all had warned me that time is both benevolent and unbearable. Past tense settles like gravel in throat. The body deems it dirty and difficult to maintain. That loss alters the face. That you do not recognize your own kin because you no longer look the same. Familiar features beneath unusual colors. A family turned fractured at the break of dawn. Thank you. Let's hear it for Jacqueline Unconjera. Keep that love going for our next poet, Ezra England. Hello. Uh, this one is called The Greenpeace Piss Up. <laughs> How do you move a grave? You don't. Not respectfully, there's no rest in peace when pieces of skin are burnt from community. No one speaks, no one needs to. Everything to say feels shallow and see-through. You can see, too, the way beads of sweat drip from heads of the office that's meant to protect. Not pretend. Defend from threat, not address the debt they owe. Now it's people are dead, that's unpayable. You treat people as replaceable, and it feels like nothing has changed at all. Every country, every day, Earth on its axis spins in practice for its future, a world peculiar, disconnected, war-torn but disaffected, a place where people see but don't comment, complain but don't change, hate and obliterate each other till nothing remains but a series of nothings. Stories from around the world that don't have a thing to do with me. It's the same news story, but this time it's in our front garden. The flower bed's got bombs in it. The soil's made of glass. And in it, our reflection, a fragmented collection of tears behind a farce, an image of a phone screen screaming for attention. No good flowers grow here, not in the tangle of wires connecting us to be separate. The air is toxic too, but by now your nose is used to the smell of shit of oil spills, fossil fuels we emit into air. Will we admit our atmosphere is scorched beyond repair? Food is money too, it tastes like plastic. You wondered if the tuna you ate for last night's supper suffer when it gorged itself to death on it. Don't talk about water, don't talk about oil, don't talk about child trafficking, don't talk about anything unless it's in conversation or being broadcast to the population on a flat screen mirror of subordination. You taste the lies on your tongue, read the news, realize that our fucked country could sink this low. It's a blow, not from a bomb, but a show of how deep we're in, how far we've sunk, how little we have left to dig. The earth isn't big enough anymore. Not for our appetite of all-consuming gore. Our future isn't littered, it's a tip. An exponential rip in our attempt to keep our planet from tearing to bits. I wonder if we'll do it. 
Crawl through the plastic piss up we've stacked up, keep our chins up as we drown in our own carbonated shit. Collect for charities to put our minds at ease when in reality the ground beneath our feet is cracked beyond belief and no amount of money can in any way appease the debt we owe to nature. To our own fucking planet. To the people halfway across the world, I raise a glass to your struggles, drunk on my privilege. Get a friend to hold my hair as I vomit. My anger at the world just cannot be stomached. I can't sleep knowing the nightmares will repeat. My hat's off to humanity. I salute you, enraged in ecstasy of the things we have yet to see. We'll need each other. Peace. Thank you. That was Ezra, England. Let's keep that love going for our next poet coming to the stage, Ife. Hey everyone, so this poem is about a shopkeeper and where I'm from we call our shopkeepers boss man. An ode to boss man. Seven-year-old me walks into your shop by himself for the first time. For him, this is adulting with each step he leaves childhood far behind him. His hair on point, school shoes swapped for Air Forces. He is ready to buy some milk. <laughs> so as he walks into your shop, sees your smile, he says to you, Hey, boss man, how much for the milk? Bossman sees the 90p in his hand and doesn't tell him it's gone up to a pound. Bossman sees the skim milk in his hand and reminds him that his family drinks semi and it's the first time he realises that Bossman may know his family more than he does. 11-year-old me goes into your shop about to start big school and you tell him that you're proud, but he isn't allowed to turn out the rest. Like, he should be an MP because English, it may not be Bossman's first language, but he knows you talk real good. Confused, 11-year-old me takes his three for one pound bud sweets and then promises to behave. And then 6 year old me goes into your shop for the first time in ages. Oh, this area has changed. What's my shop feels the same, which is to say, but next to the la dee -da coffee shops and I'm so vintage clothing, boss man's shop is defiant. But when boss man tells him, business, it ain't what it used to be. He can't help but think of all the times he went to Poundland instead of boss man's shop. How he, at 16, is realizing this way this world treats boss men. And then later on, boss man will ask about my friend. And I had to tell him about the way the justice system chewed up a boy in its teeth, played with its body, and sent it back with a sticker. And it was the first time I saw boss man lose light in his eyes, because I guess it's hard to feel like a boss man when your children start to disappear. And at 18, I told boss man about uni, and he tells me, but he's proud. So proud I didn't turn out like him. But boss man, you were the first person I met who ran their own business. You knew kindness like it was flowing through your blood. You taught a generation how to be boss man when boss men weren't always at home to teach them because a boss man holds a community in his breath. He holds struggle in his smile. And all I have ever wanted is to make you proud. The last time I went to boss man's shop, he wasn't there. And there were new signs on the door and new prices on the floor, and there was hummus where a heart used to be. And I wanted to look for you, but it was the first time I realized that I didn't even know your real name. Like most superheroes, it was your best kept secret. Let's hear it for Ife. Keep that love going for your next poet to the stage, Spencer Mason. All right, still all right, even. Uh, two drinks later, so you're probably better. <laughs> uh, this is called My Unfortunate Daughter. Come, my dearest sweet. Come willing with smoke. Come and stitch yourself by this fire here and help yourself to talks. Now, do you see these flames, my love, and their dance of tribunal for you? Or do you only see burning anger from when they took all you had left to lose? 
And do you think about your lover, girl, and how he left with no goodbye? Would you go to his funeral, my love, should you meet before he die? Yes, I know that he did lust wrongly, left family for bank account, but you are better off without him and his breath of cigarettes and stout. Yes, I mind as you got older, you learned all of your own accord. You always kept Dundee's rebel heart. You never did what you were told. You always slept so sound, so sweet it seemed, forever dreaming true and bold. Yet I know how these nights have gotten darker as you have gotten old. See, they considered it genetics, my love. I gave thee all I had to give, and so with that all these demons that always plagued me are now too in your soul to live. And I do know that you cry at night, my brave, yes. I know these terrors and these frights. I know how these voices convene, connive, convince you falsities are right when they scream and scourge and savage proclamations. I know how they reduce you to your knees and know that they do claim that they are salvation these Machiavellian schemes to get just what they please well they have been around a while my dear I have seen this all before I know these things that you fear and that you feel and that your heart has become torn between moral questions of deserving love your callousness doubting you'll ever be enough to find a humble suitor of honest heart to make you sing like the whitest of doves. See, I know this love as these fears were as they always will be to see beg, barter, plead with your own forsaken mind and still find you cannot gratify that plea. But you must not be got by deceit, my dear, no. No, do not let them get you down. You must never let your demons delude you into believing that you are just a frown on a cruel man's forehead, covered in his sweat. No, you must never settle to be the chips in a devil's bet, for you are not your illness. You are so much more. You must always cherish those caramel eyes, only chase what they adore. Yes, I know you do not believe me, my sweet, but you will. Of this I am sure. Just because you believe the devil is in you, it does not mean you are not pure. So leave an old man on his own bonny lass and let thee never doubt yourself. You will be loved despite my wrongs, and for that I'll drink to your health. Thank you. Let's hear it for Spencer Mason. Okay, we are halfway through the second half of the slam. Um, again, like I said about the judges, like the young people on the stage, if you like anything that you've heard to them, yeah, there's the vote, but go up to them and tell them afterwards. Um, go up and find out about their work, look them up online, find out what they're doing. There's not a lot of money in poetry, and we survive on public adoration. So please um, give your support to the young people. This is a showcase of their work. I know there's been a lot of heavy poems. I know there's been a lot of big themes. So I don't want to sound too hippy-dippy, but can we all just take a deep breath in and out together? Okay, and we're gonna really focus on the last five poems of the night. Judges, are we all good? Okay, great. So, please welcome to the stage our sixth poet of the second half. Give it up for Leo Drayton. Hello. <laughs> um, this next one is called The Welsh Me, and it is about my name. I am from Wales. I don't really talk like that. I just felt the need to exaggerate my accent so that you would know that I'm not lying. I am from Wales. Born in a hospital with a daffodil on its side, I had bara breath and cowl running through my veins. The doctors thought it was strange when I was born belting, my hin lad when had I an an oil e me. But it wasn't. That's how all Welshmen are born, with a song in our hearts, Calon Lan and Shaun Caneon. When I was kicking in my mum's belly, I was practicing the clock shot, preparing for the downshot disco in the Eisteddfod. Cardiff grown, I am Welsh and proud to be. 
But when I was born the second time and asked what name I wanted to accompany my new adopted pronouns he, I fucked up. I made a mistake. I shared what I saw as the shackles of having a Welsh name, a unique name no one could pronounce. Only half my family could sift through all the vowels. I was tired of having to correct Christmas cards and cross out the Y or extra E. You see, I underestimated the time it would take to grieve. That's why they call it your dead name. I murdered it. Stuffed it in a box with all the other ornaments and artifacts, the souvenirs of a life before Leo. See, I put a lot of thought into it. Leo is a fire sign that is ruled by the sun, and I didn't get to be one. A boy born without boy's things. I wasn't born great, but with the assistance of my symptoms and the hormones I take to cure them, I'm damn well growing great. Hidden in my name is the man I always was. That boy belting anthems, singing at the top of his lungs, playing rugby in the front room and pretending he could fly. Moving forks with the force and winning sword fights. And even after all this time, that boy is still there. Except now he gets to see the sun and feel it on his skin. Stand in the warmth and feel those UV rays sink in. And you can tell me it doesn't matter. A label can't change the sweetness of a flower, but the name is a difference between a rose and a Kenim Peder. Petals just as pretty, but one grows in the soil of a glad built on the history and heritage of my people. So yes, I chose an English name, but there will always be the flam of that Welsh tan burning inside this proud Welsh man. Thank you. Let's hear it for Leo Drayton. Keep that love going for our next poet to the stage, Bonnie Coughlin. Keep that love going until you get to the mic. Hi, um, so this poem comes with a trigger warning for sexual assault. Um, if anyone wants to leave, yeah. <laughs> it's called, I Don't Love Men. <laughs> From March to May, a door creaked open. From lockdown leaked summer, breeze dusted with floating skirts, hair twists and overlapping coils and curls, short hair framed, so many beautiful faces, and oh my life, women are beautiful. I'm knocked breathless by a sapphic kind of safety. Adoration in spite of sameness, in spite of spite for my reflection. My body looks beautiful if only when it's her. I see men's bodies also, less body than shadow, vans you turn offended, I hadn't noticed them call. Sorry, sir, I'll be sure to be unsettled next time. Oh, my life, I am so sorry for your cries of not all men, but my love. I don't love you. I see boys raised. Taught not to walk round walls, but to knock them down. An all-female clean-up crew scrubbing with less love on the mind. I didn't love a man who saw my body as Ikea furniture. He didn't love me. How can he have liked me, flat-backed, flat-pack? But he did. I didn't love a man when I bled. He didn't believe me. Nose to nose with my body's voice who tried to say that period blood isn't fresh enough to drip crimson. Wombs don't shed in blood alone, but the vibrant droplet on my thigh failed to use her words or to self-identify. Knowing he said, she said, never applied when the word too absent to catch on my throat was my first word. No. I just didn't want to say it and know how to, I wanted it to stop flat backed, flat pack. I wanted him to like me. They talked about prudes and teases, women they didn't like, and if I made him stop, he might tell the others, and they might tell our coaches, and they might laugh about it, and they might think a bit about it, about me, about my body exposed in lycra, my arms, my back, when lifting boats, when drawing through, they might see him in me, still. And now, the man in the van. The Fiat, the Mazda, the boy on the wall eating his ice cream. How old is he? For him, 
to knock me back to a moment, flat back, flat pack. I'm trying to love men like women, but I can't figure out loving them second to safety. I don't hate men, I just can't love them. Thank you. Let's hear it for Bonnie Coughlin. Keep that love going for our next poet to the stage, Yasmin Dankwa. Oh dear. I hope that stays. Hiya. Um, this poem is called Fire. Imagine it. The 18th. Sixteen 16 celebration for the B-Day Queen of One, a rite of passage party to mark the occasion. And the news travelled far and fast. A vast array of black kid communities travelled from up and down the kingdom, emerged from the margins and rose from the mundane weekday ashes like phoenixes. Music, rhythm, they feeling it, good vibes, good times all around its lit. Topped by an MC spitting on the mic. Spinning beginnings of their history, a whitewashed mystery of how these shabines, these blues parties came to be. You see, these kids were descendants of the Windrush generation who RSVP'd their invitation to a false United Nation. Always spite, incited against them by the far right white police media. Politicians always found it easier to point the finger at the other within a threat to their Caucasian kingdom, now swamped by cultures foreign. So, in an us versus them scarcity mentality, they retaliated, verbally harmed and physically scarred them. Even barred them from jobs, housing and bars because of the color of their skin. Rivers of black blood boiling spilt from powerlessness and state oppression, but they never raised fists to resist this nah. Never raised fists to resist this nah. Instead, they hooked their hopes onto the weekend and found freedom in home, in music. Sound systems emitting summertime shipped from across the Atlantic that lit the darkest of skies. With remnants of reggae, soul, calypso and rock steady, lost boys and girls now found getting ready to make Neverlands in a land that never saw them. Lost boys and girls now found getting ready to make Neverlands in a land that never saw them rise from the ashes like phoenixes. Music, rhythm, they're feeling it. Good vibes, good times all around, it's lit. And the party kids of 81 inherited this. Yeah, the party kids of 81 inherited this. Now. Listen to the melanin, breathe life into silences. Listen to the melanin, breathe life into silences. Listen to their voices, breathe life into life, into life, into life, into fire. Every time I close my eyes, I can only see the fire. Thank you. Let's hear it for Yasmin Dankwa. Keep that love going for your penultimate slammer of the evening, Michael Sukan. Hello. Um, this is called Imaginary. Y squared plus 5x squared minus 16 equals. Adoption meant X equals two different solutions, imaginary and rational. Fathers, the quadratic formula won't push me on the swings. Y equals part Indo-Caribbean, German, British, Palestinian, Guyanese, X equals unknown. Everything that can be said with the alphabet, infinity. A science experiment in a Petri dish escapes from Area 51, carrying 84 watermelons. They drop five, 
Determine if your imaginary dad is real. Sonic the Hedgehog, Muhammad Ali and Neil, a street artist, were some of my role models. Then Neil passed away. Slipping across the past in Zeus's tinsel sleeve at high speed on a rusted rocket radius, they multiply cigarettes at the hospital. And there's my granddad with Pi, the man who helped raise me rational. He's ill, diabetes, cardinal infarction, arthritis, or is it a stranger? We're sure my imaginary dad could be a power ranger, red soldier, photographs of a man I never met, didn't care about, goosebumps like a superstar in my attic that we look the same, except there's copper chestnut stains on my skin. He's six three, I'm five ten, nine ish. And he's ginger, so he must not have a soul. Apparently, he would throw teacups and saucers <laughs> like rapscallion magpies peck my face. Calculate how many teaspoons of shame and guilt are required to fertilize test tube babies in mushy pea goo. Sketch the graph of a vicious cycle in relation to the man, square root of boy. Prove the location of Y is 12 degrees east and 34 degrees north, tortured at refugee camps and strip searched for its language. Even numbers are crushed alive by pythons. Their prime fathers will not save them apart from two, which survived. Granddad's got a berry gambling addiction and rages, swears like lasers, breaths of belligerent lasers, razors. <laughs> but he was there 76% of the time. If X is greater than minus one, evaluate if digging for skittle bombs in pixel portals of uranium ash will create a nuclear family. Forensic results show the twinkle in my imaginary dad's pants is now a wrinkle in my face. I didn't need my imaginary dad. I worked it out on my own. Let's hear it for Michael Sukhan. Keep your love going. Our final slam performance of the evening. Let's hear it. All your energy, all your love. Believer! Hello. Uh, everyone still, like, awake? Uh, okay, great. Um, this time, this one does have a title, um, because I managed to come up with a title for this one. So, this is Blood Money. A kernel teardrop shape. I'd call it loneliness if I knew how to pronounce it. Standing in the smoking section, an older lesbian asks for a cigarette. It feels like a love confession, feels like a warm meal and a reassuring gaze, feels like being rattled around. So the little plastic ball inside of me clangs around and shakes. She does not look at me twice says thanks and turns away, my voice hitches, I open my mouth, almost calling out, except ten tenderness tastes like salt and slick and rust. I know I wouldn't love like this if it didn't. Crumbling away at the corners of myself, you do this too much, my mum said. To me, splitting yourself open can feel like a relief if the exorcism is done by a kind priest and I wanted them to hit me. So then I could memorize their touch. So I sacrificed myself at the altar of love. Desperation curls, setting underneath my tongue, but it's all blood money. This town would make anyone sick. Wool and blue, that warm July, I am pulling on all of the threads now. Hollow gnaws away at my bones in my upper left ribs. I have tried asking it what it wants. I do not know what it wants. So 
I call it God to give it a name. Do not mistake that for some kind of declaration. I would worship anything that could ring me out and give me a new face. It's mortifying, this rotten, warm want. I have to leave home to get a homecoming. The cigarette in my fingers burns out. Thank you. Let's hear it for Leva and all of the poems that you've heard tonight. Wow, 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 wow. Okay, so that is the end of the official slam. I can now announce that the lines are open for you to vote for your favorite poet of the evening. So there should be... Uh, Free sheets on your tables with QR codes. And people up top, you should have got them when you came in. They might, there should be some on the seats around you. You can scan the QR code uh, and you can vote for one person who was your favorite from this evening. People at home, um, you can do the same. If you follow the link that should be appearing on your screen right now, follow the link and you can cast your vote uh, for your top poet of the evening for the Audience Vote Award. So many varied performances, so many incredible poets. Let's hear it again for all of the poets who performed tonight. I know that everybody is having a little confer, having a little rummage, having a little look at the phones, totally get it. I'm gonna give you mm, 20 seconds to have a little chit chat and then we are gonna introduce our next judge to the stage for you to give your full attention to. So, 15 seconds. And then we're going to have absolute silence. Sorry? Oh, yeah, okay, that's a great idea. So, we're going to have everybody's names again, in case you've forgotten. Does everybody want that? Good from you, person at the back. Well done, okay. Do you want to, like, stand up when I say your name? Sure. Okay, just because they're not in, um, you're not sat in the, the right order. Okay, here we go, sorry. So, um, you have... Lever. Yeah, give him a cheer. Michael Sukan. Yasmin Dankwa. Bonnie Cochlin. Leo Drayton. Spencer Mason. Ife. Jacqueline Nkonjere. And Rhea Bronte. Okay, so hopefully that has... Oh, my day. Sorry, babe. Where did you go? God. Terrible. Okay, and last but not least, Ezra England. Oh, my God. I'm so sorry. Okay, so hopefully that's jogged your memory. You know who you're voting for. Yes, yes, yes. Great, great, great. Okay, I'm going to welcome our next poet to the stage because we need to keep things moving. Um, please welcome, I listed all of her many, many, many accolades before. Incredible poet. Please welcome her to the stage. One of our judges from this evening. Jaspreet, sorry. Oh, gosh, where's my bloody thing gone? Where's everything bloody well gone? Here we go. Jaspreet Kaur. So this one's for my mum. It's about empire and unequal cultural exchange. Nothing heavy. <laughs> Brown women wore shisha in their clothes since the 17th century, and now they're worn more beautifully as if they weren't meant for me. I see them on runways, weaved into their embroidery so cheaply, when for centuries their reflections were enough for a man to fall in love so deeply, because brown women have been wearing nuts since the 16th century, and now they're worn more beautifully as if they weren't meant for me. I remember one time I wore a bindi to school, I thought it was pretty, but they called me a fool. They said, go back to your country with your stinking clothes. 
And now I see them in almost every music video, so I say, hey, what now makes it so cool? Because brown women have been wearing files since the first century, and now they're worn more beautifully as if they weren't meant for me. Their chimes alone acted as inspiration for poetry. You should read the Gilabati Garam. Maybe, or maybe not. Maybe I'm wrong to assume that the same mouths that made the word immigrant so dirty are the same mouths craving for a curry on a Friday night or a chai tea latte. Because brown women have been wearing Mendi Valehat since the Vedic century and now they're worn more beautifully as if they weren't meant for me. There was patterns on my palms that could put petals to shame. Their stains were enough for lions to lose their tame. Their curves and lines are considered hypnotic. But now I bet your henna tattoos make you feel so damn hipster and so damn exotic. I'm not saying that our lives can't be shared in symbiotic. I'm just saying that we shouldn't have been degraded in the process. Whilst they mocked our linguistics, the artistics and the symbolic, we were crying to be cut loose from the shackles of colonialism. Oh, the irony of brown women scraping their heavenly dark skin with beauty creams trying to be lighter, while some fake up their tans, we cry to be whiter. My thick hair was decided for me before I was even in the womb. And let me assure you that my brown skin is not some kind of costume. We tried our best to adopt a cultural milieu. We molded ourselves into the surrounding area like glue, but who are we trying to fool? We just look more out of place like animals in a zoo, but assimilation is a complete separate issue. And I'll leave that to Fanon to discuss because we shouldn't have to blend. For once, can we not pretend that my beautiful culture is not a trend to be passed on, like bell-bottom jeans and feathered hair? This is my beauty, and I'm happy to share, but not at the cost of belittlement, and not in combination with a comment on my mother's accent. We have been too busy living in the dust of an empire that burnt our worth, that we refuse to grow from the ashes. But now I am no longer ashamed. I shall wear my gargoyle along my long lashes and I shall wear my seeds with pride so we can flourish. So sure, wrap yourself up in a sari whilst we unravel ourselves from self-hatred and low self-esteem. Unweave the oppression and we'll let go of the victimhood stitched into the seams. Thank you. Let's hear it for Jazz Rico. We are going to go straight into our special guest of the evening. We are very, very, very excited to be able to introduce this poem, poet to the Roundhouse stage. Please give all of your love to George the Poet. Thank you very much. It's a privilege to be here. Just one more round of applause for everyone who's been sharing their poetry tonight. I just want to share a piece that always reminds me um, of the potential of these words, man. And it's inspired by a real life uh, event. See me, um, every now and then I go to prisons and I talk to the guys about socialism and our own conditions, and how we're supposed to fix them. The other day I had to go to Brixton. The man them asked me what I think of rap. I said, there's music and politics and we ain't supposed to mix them. People think my issues with spitting, it isn't. It's that spitting never stopped you from sitting in prison. And that seems odd to me. Rap's a commodity. 
It's got to be the best thing adapted from poverty. If so many men have seen a payout, why aren't their communities guaranteed a way out? Everyone took a second to ruminate. And I felt like I started a true debate. So I'm all getting ready to adjudicate because I love seeing these guys communicate. And then one man broke the silence. He said, you see, when I rap, I'm not promoting violence. I just talk about the roads to motivate the younger Gs under me that are holding weight. People just get offended because they don't relate. And I knew what he was saying, so I told him straight. I said, bro, 100%, no debate. I understand what men are talking about, but I've become a man that plans on sorting this out, and I'm sick of being told to wait. Hip-hop's been around for time, and all I can see is some tattered celebrities that can spin around the rhyme. Where's the long-term economic plan? I ain't going to step to the mic if I ain't speaking on it, fam. Rap's a commodity adapted from poverty. It should be owned by the streets, but it's owned by the labels who make our own kind compete when we're the only ones that should have the monopoly. Rap's a commodity adapted from poverty. From a minority, it attracts the majority. But the minority's issues ain't sorted out enough, so why is no one talking about this stuff? Everyone started getting introspective, and then one of them and them interjected. He said, it's true. This image has been projected, but the culture that we're from hasn't been protected. And then he carried on. Me, I was literally mute. He said, I'm a man that's in prison because he shoots. A lot of these rap guys are talking about my life, but I'd rather listen to you than listen to these youths. George, when you're locked up, you get time to think. Otherwise, your mind will shrink. So I like hearing things that expand my mind, not how I'm shot in O's and I bang my nine. Furthermore, a lot of these men are lying. Sheep can't understand the lion. I said, bro, all I can tell you is I'm a man on a mission going ham on this vision, and I ain't no damn politician. No disrespect. <laughs> I'm a stakeholder trying to take over and give these kids a future that ain't so dark. So the aim of this game is to make dough dark. And I won't lie, it bothers me I'm having to discern this whole ideology in capitalist terms, but I'm not in a position to execute a revolution. So for now, my resolution's evolution. The first thing to acknowledge is we need our own colleges, scholarships, politics, governance systems to prioritize our own brothers and sisters. Secondly, we need intellectual weaponry, research institutes, employers and friends in high places, judges and lawyers from ends. Thirdly, education is very certain. Our kids need to be leading by at least 2030. Fourthly, let's look out for each other everywhere, north, east, west, and south. Let's test this out, Bridget. That's how it's got to be. And number five is one word, property. Our communities are in need of this. If you want, I get a caller to leave you lot a reading list because... I'd rather he's the one providing the words for you to consider when you're riding your birds, so that's my five-point plan. You understand? It might sound a bit strange, but if you're down with this change, then it's you who I'm giving it out to. But at the same time, it isn't about you. It's the youth we'll be living it out through. And it's going to happen with or without you. The room went quiet again. And the man said, you're going to start a rioting pen. Tupac tried it once, you're going to try it again. You know they're going to block your bars on purpose. I said, thank you for reminding me, bro. That's my point. Rap's not music. It's a broadcasting service. We decide what we talk about. So if it's more than dope on curbs and smoking herbs, then how can I really go unheard when my job description is spoken word? Thank you very much, man. Have a good night. Let's hear it for George the Poet. Okay, so the votes have been counted and verified, and we do have the scores ready. 
Um, very quickly, I know we're all chomping at the bit to get the scores, um, but just a, qu a quick history. If, if you're not aware, Poetry Slam was started in the 1980s in America as a gimmick to get people to come and watch poetry. So thanks for coming tonight and engaging in it, but it's all been an illusion. It's all to get you to come and watch poetry and engage and support the young people here tonight. The maxim around the world is the points are not the point, the point is the poetry, and that really is true. So please, let's hear it again for all of the young people who have taken part tonight. Please tell them if you like their work, go and find out about what they're doing, support them after tonight. <laughs> to announce the winners of tonight's slam, uh, a very special person, the CEO and artistic director of the Roundhouse, my twin brother, please welcome to the stage, Marcus Davey. I'm a little taller. Oh, it's fantastic to see you and to be live back at the Roundhouse. Isn't that fantastic? Look at you. You're fantastic. You're almost as beautiful and wonderful as the people behind me. Thank you very much, you, all of you. You've been amazing tonight. Thank you. Um, first of all, I want to say a few words, um, but um, I've got some thank yous to make um, first. It's really stunning to be back here in the, light, in, the, in the main space live. For the last couple of years, this has been done online. And the effect of having an audience for a poet is visceral, it's meaningful, and you've been amazing. So first of all, thank you. A round of applause to you. The Poetry Slam at the Roundhouse grew from something very small 16 years ago. Who was there for the first one? Yes, we have some people who were there on the first one. Yes, you were, I remember. Yes, thank you very much for all of you who've been coming over all of these years. You've been incredible. But it is now national. Yes. We have partners in Gloucester, in Manchester, and in Glasgow. Um, I want you, and you'll be, those of you who are watching from around the country, for you to say a big thank you to them, because without them, some of these amazing poets wouldn't be here with us tonight, so thank you. <laughs> yes, the poets make this night, but actually, behind the scenes, there are others. Of course, there's a very generous family of donors that support us, funders and donors, who support the Roundhouse to do its incredible work with 11 to 25-year-olds. For those of you who don't know, just below your feet is Europe's largest creative center for young people. And you, the supporters, make it all possible. So a huge thank you to those of you who like to remain anonymous, and for all of you that are happy to be named, I'm gonna name a couple of you. So, the Arts Council of England, Taylor Wessing, who are here tonight, the Paul Hamlin Foundation and the Norman Trust for their continued and wonderful support. And I'm delighted that the Mayor of Camden is here tonight. Thank you very much for being with us. We first met over 20 years ago when you were mayor again then, so it's wonderful that you come back tonight. Um, some of you are actually walking 36 miles next Saturday in one day to raise money for the Roundhouse. Yes, amazing. And I can tell you, thir mile 33 is really painful. And if anybody you'd like to join the walk, it's not too late. And some of you are actually walking with me, because I'll be doing it for the third time in three years. Um, I'd like to, um, yes, an extra act of generosity, a generosity tonight, as Taylor Westing has given an extra amount of money to support the, the slam, so the prize winner gets that amazing thousand pounds. So a big thank you to you. It's
it's very rare for me to be able to get up on, on this main stage and do some thank yous. In fact, this is the only time for the last couple of years I haven't had that chance. So this is my real chance to say some big thank yous. Yes, donors, thank you very much. Yes, poets, you've been amazing. But this is my chance to thank my colleagues. They are the most amazing, hardworking, dedicated group of people I've ever met. And I've been here quite a long time, and this group, they are just fantastic. So will you join me in thanking them? And another big thank you to all our wonderful trustees who give her their time, effort, resources, advice, and I can see a couple of you, several, quite a few of you in here tonight. So thank you to you as well. Tonight is, of course, a celebration, isn't it? It's a celebration of creativity and the imagination. But in the face of great adversity, it's a challenge, isn't it? In the face of moral corruption of our government, sorry, corruption in our government, it's economically challenging, socially challenging, intense mental health challenges on so many people in our society, and also culturally as well. Devoid of being able to go out to places like this, devoid of a creative curriculum in school, devoid of so many things that we used to expect as part of our society that they're not there or they're not there for everyone anymore. I think the Roundhouse, in, this, in the face of all of this, is actually a mark of resistance in itself. To enable incredible voices like these to be heard week in and week out, it kind of gives us hope that there is and can be a better future than the one that we might be standing in right now. Resistance, honesty, and integrity. Remember that word, integrity? I think we've heard it tonight, haven't we? Let's thank them again. These great poets, yes, these great poets have a wonderful future ahead of them, but they need nurturing. They need supporting. So what can we do? Well, I'll tell you a little bit about what the Roundhouse is doing. Last year, I talked about the fact that we're just starting work on a new building just out in the yard. Some of you will have walked past it tonight and seen it out of the ground. And by this time next year, it'll be fully operational and will enable us to double the numbers of young people we work with to 15,000 a year. Not only that, we're increasing the age range because, my God, over the last couple of years, people have been held back. We're increasing the age range so we can go from 11 to 30, and that will be a major difference to so many of these young poets. But what can you do? Don't you feel powerless sometimes when you look at it and just think, war, corruption, what can you do? Be that resistance. Join a board. Join a governor's in a school. Talk about creativity. When that politician comes knocking on your door, that wants that MP, potential MP in your area, say, you know, these things matter to me. Will you represent what I think is important? We're very lucky with our councillors in Camden. They support us and they speak for us, but not everyone is so lucky. So make your voice heard. The only way we can make change is we say, make our voice heard. Because I completely believe that we can make the changes that we need to make, especially if we've got the incredible voices of the young people that are sitting behind me tonight. Don't you think? Yeah. Okay. I've been speaking for too long, and now it's time for me to say, first of all, a big thank you to these incredible judges. And it's wonderful to invite Maureen back from last year. You are, you are just fantastic.
And we all love Toby, don't we? And at some of the more vibrant language, I've been watching these wonderful people over this side, how they interpret some of the words that have been spoken. So a huge thank you to our BSL interpreters. A thousand pounds for the first prize, 400 pounds and 300 pounds and a 400 pounds for the vote that you've made. And I am gonna now tell you who's won. Actually, this is on really big writing, so I'm going to have to hide it, so I'm going to be here a bit. Um, I do have a, a box with, for a, a prize in it for the winner, and it isn't hard cash you're getting tonight. I'm sorry, it's a bank transfer, so you're just going to have to put up with that. Um, so, the first, the, in third place, and this is why it's so important. Sorry, I will get on with it. Uh, 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 it's so important that we are spreading around the country. In third place, Spencer Mason from Glasgow. Give him a round of applause. Aren't they amazing? Aren't they amazing? Yes. Look, I'm just hogging the limelight for a little bit. Come on. And in second place, Ife. And don't we all want to dance? Yeah. Very good. So, in first prize. I know. I'm getting on from the side here. Do the audience vote first. I was going to do it, but anyway. Um, first prize is coming after this. <laughs> I told you, I'm hogging the limelight. Um, the, all, your vote, all of you who voted, thank you very much for voting goes to Ezra. I don't know what's in here. Um, but the first prize also goes to Ezra. But I know you'll all want to say they're all winners tonight because they truly are. Please give me a last round of applause to these wonderful poets. Thank you. Thank you. One and a half grand. They have hit the bloody jackpot. Let's hear it again for our winners. Amadeus, congratulations. Okay, I know we've heard a lot of poetry tonight, we've heard a lot of talking, so we're going to go out of the door. Um, we just need to do a few final thank yous, finishing off the amazing list of thank yous that uh, Marcus did, repeating some of them. So can we just have a low-level round of applause? A little bit higher. Brilliant. And then we'll give some cheers as we go along. Okay, so let's hear it from Marcus, all the volunteers, the amazing staff here at the Roundhouse. Dom, Rena, and Jack, particularly, who worked on the slam. 
and all of the other staff members, the incredible tech team here at the Roundhouse. All of the young people who took part in all of the heats, not just the 10 that you heard tonight, as well as our finalists, George the Poet and our panel of judges, our BSL interpreters, Jackie Beckford and Peter Abraham, ODT, our fantastic DJ. I believe that is everybody, I think. Um, I've been Toby Campion. Thank you. Um, if I've missed anyone, thank you so much. Uh, it's been an amazing slam. Have a great night and we'll see you again next year. Take care. Thank you.